Okay. Hello, my name is Jeffrey Lear. I am a student at George Washington University, and I am here interviewing Dr. Sarah M. Glaser for the 2015 NASA Astrobiology Debates. Dr. Glaser is a research associate at the One Earth Future Foundation, a Denver-based nonprofit, nonprofit, and a scientist at the University of Denver. Dr. Glaser earned a PhD in oceanography from the Scripps Institution of Ocean Oceanography and specializes in fisheries, food, web ecology, and complex systems. Thank you for accepting this interview, Dr. Glaser. You're welcome. It's my pleasure. Dr. Glaser and I are here to discuss the following topic, which was prepared in partnership with the NASA Astrobiology Program. The topic reads as follows, resolved. An overriding ethical obligation to protect and preserve extraterrestrial microbial life and ecosystems should be incorporated into international law. Now, Dr. Glaser, to start, why don't you tell us a little bit about your area of expertise and how it relates to our topic? Well, Jeffrey, as you mentioned uh, in the introduction, I'm a fisheries ecologist and oceanographer. So in some ways, my uh, field of expertise is somewhat removed from the topic of extraterrestrial microbial life. However, I think one of the reasons I was asked to be part of this interesting debate is because my um, studies also take a big picture look at food web ecology and our ability, our being humans, abilities to make predictions in complex ecological systems. And that has a lot of relevance for understanding the impact that humans might have on microbial life. Um, so for example, I have looked at food web interactions between predators and their prey, um, how changes in the resource base affect different populations, and how those have ripple effects throughout food webs and food chains. And in particular, the effect that humans have when we start removing or tinkering with parts of those food webs. Okay. So how easily do you think it would be for humans to go into an extraterrestrial environment and disrupt a food web? I think it might be quite easy. I mean, um, I guess one of my questions posed for you is, in, in the um, context of this resolution or this topic, are we talking specifically about Mars, or are we just supposed to use our imagination and think about any particular planet that would be habitable? Uh, I think for the sake I think for the sake of the debates, the focus isn't particularly on Mars, but uh, can can be. Uh, I know a lot of the literature that people are using and that people are referencing are uh, is focused on Mars. So uh, with that in mind, what would your perspective be uh, in an environment like Mars? I guess um, in an environment like Mars, where um, we think that if there's life, it's quite small, I think that there could be parts of the planet where we could have a large impact and other parts that would be not impacted whatsoever. Um, if I'm letting my imagination run wild and thinking about um, a science fiction-y Battlestar Galactica type of uh, world or universe in which there are... Um, vertebrates living or even other human-like colon colonies on other planets, I think that it would be very likely that our presence would have a big impact on the food webs if we just start, decided to start harvesting. Um, and some, some of the studies of marine ecosystems in particular show that humans, even at very, very small subsistence levels of harvesting, um, so 10,000 years ago, had pretty demonstrable impacts on the ecosystems in which they started tinkering. So there, um, there was work done by Jeremy Jackson and a lot of people in his lab at Scripps Institution of Oceanography that showed that back even before um, the colonization of North America by Europeans, Native Americans had a huge impact impact on the fisheries and and even the non-fisheries ecosystem. So, you know, even small amounts of harvesting tend to have very large impacts on food webs that are have, have very strong connections. So, with that in mind, would you say that the only solution, the only way to preserve uh, extraterrestrial microbial life would be no human interaction whatsoever? I I don't think that I would say the only way to preserve it. I think, um, you know, when I think of harvesting, I think more of creatures that we are taking for um, resource consumption for ourselves, so eating them, for example. Um, and, and that wouldn't be the case with microbial life. So if we're talking specifically about microbial life, 
as far as harvesting goes, I don't think that we would be a risk to the survival of different species of microbes, um, at least from a harvesting point of view. Um, so if the question is whether the only way to preserve, I guess, I guess I would have to say, my definition of preserve would be that some of the species still exist. So I would, I would disagree with that statement. I think that there are ways that humans could potentially interact with extraterrestrial microbial life that would still preserve those microbes, preserve the, the species, preserve the diversity, um, you know, I think if you're talking about an individual microbe and we decided to do studies, that there would definitely be loss of uh, microbes in, in an individual sense, but maybe not from a species perspective. So then, would you say that something like an in environmental preserver, uh, preservation of just the ecosystems would be an effective way for humans and extraterrestrial microbial life to coexist? Uh, yes, and I think that you hit on a key point when you say the preservation of the ecosystem. So one of the challenges that we have here on Earth is preserving large enough spaces of land that we effectively cover the entire ecosystem. So for example, even something large like say Yellowstone National Park um, has had challenges in preserving some of its top predators because of breaking up their natural habitat and range. So in order to effectively understand how large a preserve would need to be, we'd need to know the extent of different species. Um, if we're just talking about microbes then, I think an important consideration would be diversity and making sure that we have um, systems or preserves that are large enough to maintain the diversity that is uh, exists in a place before we habit it. And, and I, that raises an interesting dilemma for us, which is as soon as we arrive to a new area, we're going to start changing it. And so trying to have very minimal, and when I say minimal, I guess I mean in an invasive sort of way, impacts on the ecosystem while we're able to sample it would necessarily be... Um, an important first step to understanding the diversity, the range, um, all the, the needs of the different microbes in order to design preserves that would be large enough. Based on with your experience with preservation here, uh, what, what would you say would be the best way to minimize the dilemma that you were just talking about? Hmm. That's where my um, knowledge of microbial biology and then uh, protocols for, say, landing on the moon and landing on Mars cuts against my ability to, to answer that question very well, because I think you're really talking about some technicalities, some, some precautions we might take. Um, I guess I would say that, on the one hand, it's, it's just going to be a a practical question. We're, we're not going to be able to rapidly colonize another planet. Um, you know, it, it will start our exploration. Let's just take Mars. Our exploration will start off very incrementally. So if we have the, the um, Mars rover right now, it's just one instrument on Mars trying to do some sampling, then I think that that doesn't carry with it the very large risks that say landing a thousand rovers on Mars would carry with it. Um, however, as soon, you also run into then the, the problem of making sure that what you sample is representative of what's actually out there. So we know, for, for example, the, and I can't remember the name of it, but the lander that is on the asteroid right now is having a hard time collecting all of the data that they wanted it to collect. So we're naturally going to be limited by our technical capabilities to be able to answer the question, have we covered enough ground? Have we collected enough species to represent the diversity? Um, but as far as technical approaches to sort of minimizing our footprint when we enter a, a new space, I guess I would leave that up to the experts, um, pro you know, probably at NASA to know things about um, sterilization and certain protocols that would help in minimizing the impact we would have. So unfortunately I missed a, a good portion of that answer. Uh, uh, the, the computer froze on me for some reason, but um, let's move on to, aside from the idea of preserving the ecosystem itself, how might human development impact the evolution of microbial life and, the, and specifically the species rather than the ecosystem? Ah, the species rather than the ecosystem. So, you know, I think that that's a question of time frames. Um, I think that in the very short term, and by short term, I mean weeks to months to maybe even a year or two, that we might not have a significant impact on the evolution of a species. That being said, um, 
microbes evolve very, very quickly. And um, you know, just hearkening back to what I mentioned before, the impact of um, ex excess amounts of mortality that that impact has on species, um, humans have an outsized effect compared to natural predators. There is a paper that just came out last week in the journal Science that called humans super predators and showed that the effects that we have on fish is 14 times greater than any other natural predator. And that's largely because of the amount of fish that we harvest. And so if you if you look at humans as something as an, as an outside predator or an alien predator, and in the case of another world, we would literally be an alien predator, I think that we would potentially underestimate our effects um, or that the effects that we would have would be greater than we might anticipate. Um, and, and so I think that there is a significant risk that even in a matter of say two or three years that the effects of um, harvesting or if we were to introduce disease or contamination into a species could have significant evolutionary impacts if we're talking about microbial communities. Do you think those evolutionary impacts could be ultimately fatal for some species? I think that there's definitely a risk. Um, again, as I said, if there was, say, the introduction of contamination or disease, and without without having any idea what is critical to the life of a certain microbe, it could be even something that is relatively harmless on Earth that we just didn't have any idea would be poisonous to another species. And again, it also um, is a question of spatial scales. So, if there are, say, small pockets of microbes that are one type of species that doesn't exist anywhere else on the planet, and that's where we have an impact, then we could certainly wipe out different species. And I think that if you're talking about a planet like Mars, that certainly does not appear to have large amounts of life, then we're talking about small areas of life that are very isolated from each other. And those are the circumstances under which rapid evolution occurs. So you can think about, say the lakes of Africa that used to be one large lake, then they dried up and became lots of small lakes. And within those smaller lakes, lots of species evav evolved very rapidly. It's called species, species eight. Uh, it's <laughs> called, spe I can't say it right now. Um, uh, radiation, species radiation. Um, anyway, something like that is probably happening in areas like Mars or planets like Mars that have very isolated communities. And so, yeah, I think that it could easily be the case that we wipe out an entire species uh, simply because they only exist in a very limited location. Okay, from a science, to, from a, excuse me, from a scientific standpoint, do you think that wiping out uh, or even taking the risk of wiping out an entire species is something that is uh, harmful? Yes, I do. I think it's very harmful. Um, if we're only talking about microbes, I think that um, I don't know if the question becomes an ethical one or not. Um, I mean, certainly there is an argument that could be made that we have the prerogative to um, to protect any form of life from extinction. I think that humans don't follow the, that own prerogative here on Earth. I think that we wipe out species before we've even discovered them. Um, and some of those are, are invertebrate and vertebrate species that are much higher forms of life than, say, microbes. But if you're talking about a planet that only has microbial life, then you're talking about the highest form of life on that particular planet. And to um, take a risk of potentially wiping out species, given the way that that species interact with one another, given the way that keystone species and food webs are really critical to the function of an entire ecosystem, we could have consequences that go far beyond the extinction of that one species. So you said that consequences could go beyond the extinction of a species. What kind of impacts do you think there would be specifically? It depends on the species that would go extinct. So there are, um, on Earth anyway, what are known as keystone predators. And keystone predators are um, called that because when you remove them from a food web, there are ripple effects throughout the food web. And we tend to think of these as strong linkages. So if you imagine a food web as a spider web, and each um, node has a species and it's connected to lots of other species, keystone predators have very strong linkages to many other species strong linkages to just one species, but it's a critical species. So maybe a, a really important prey item in that food web. And so there have been empirical studies done here on Earth that show that the removal of just one can have ripple effects. And that could be either from 
from a predator, a prey, or a competition point of view. So it doesn't have to be a prey item. I think we tend to think of these sorts of ripple effects from the point of view of a food source is removed, when in fact some of these ripple effects can occur when a predator is removed. If that predator regulates the prey that live below it on the food chain, and then that prey in turn regulates prey below it, what can happen is that the, the prey, the first set of prey can explode in population because its predator is gone. Did I freeze? Okay, I think I froze. We're having a little, sorry, we're having a little bit of technical difficulties again. Uh, so, I, thought, I thought so. Okay. So, what are the potential scientific benefits for future generations of maintaining a pristine extraterrestrial ecosystem for scientific study? Well, I'm not sure that I that the premise of your question is very sound because on the one hand you said pristine, but on the other hand you said scientific study. So even scientists who try to have minimal damage in a place that we're sampling, we will be killing items potentially or altering their environment. So I'm not sure that it can both remain pristine and be available for scientific study. Um, to remain pristine, we would just have to avoid going there altogether. To um, preserve a system for scientific uh, sampling, however, it doesn't necessarily have to be pristine. And once we go there and recognize that it won't be, the best thing to do would be to try to map the area, understand where there is heterogeneity in landscapes, understand where there's heterogeneity in species distribution. And the real problem for us, and this is true on Earth as well, when we have an unexplored area, is that we just don't know what that looks like. And until we know what that looks like, we're just going to be invasive. Okay, so then what would you say would be the benefits of avoiding human development in a particular ecosystem altogether and instead preserving it with minimal damage for scientific study? Um, you know, I don't, I don't know. Well, the benefits would, s let me see if I understand your question. You're saying preserve, we, that we would be preserving it for scientific study? Um, yeah. Okay. So, so your your question is basically: Are we on, we're only going in for scientific study, and that's all? And what would be the benefits of that? Correct. Okay, so I think, um, I mean, you've already touched on some of the potential benefits, which would be better understanding forms of evolution. I think that I, my resting assumption would be that the models that we have already developed here on Earth for things like population dynamics, the way that species interact with each other. I would assume that those mathematical models also apply to other systems. So to me, one of the main benefits would be collecting data to try to see where our models don't fit other worlds. And in that case, we might better be able to understand how evolution occurred here on Earth by understanding how it's ongoing, especially if we find a world in which, say, the only thing that has evolved is microbial life. In that case, we can assume Either that the, the um, conditions are not right to support higher forms of life, like invertebrates and vertebrates, we can assume that that evolution just hasn't happened yet, or we could assume that that evolution did happen and now the world has reverted back to microbial life only, in which case we would, I suppose, expect to see fossil evidence of that. So finding planets that give us a, a snapshot into what evolution might have looked like in the past or will look like in the future, I think, would be important for us refining our evolutionary models here on Earth. Fantastic. So, one more question. Does your experience with international regimes, regimes seeking to protect terrestrial life and ecosystems suggest anything about the idea of such a regime for extraterrestrial microbial life and ecosystems? Can you define international regime? Do you mean international law and treaties? I think by international regimes, I mean institutions or international institutions that are designed to protect the environment and to protect uh, life forms from, let's say, uh, human destruction. Okay, the reason I asked is just because um, in ecology, the word regime means something totally different. It, it refers to the state of an ecosystem and, and what is the particular dominant species at that time. And so your question is whether any of the international regimes here on Earth might um, be expanded to include extraterrestrial life. Is that, I just wanna make sure I have your question correct. 
Yes. The question the, the question is essentially, uh, do you think that uh, in the, the, the regimes that that people on Earth have set out to protect the environment and different species will be effective for extraterrestrial life? Well, I hate to be a cynic, but they're not very effective for protecting uh, life here on Earth. So I guess I would have to say um, that I have my doubts. I, I also think that um, if we are talking about international bodies that have um, been created here on Earth, at the very least we have international, well, we have national boundaries that define different spaces. So um, nations have... Uh, self-interest in both preserving and exploiting their own resources and ecosystems. If we start expanding that now to outside of the earth, the question I think becomes who has who has jurisdiction, who has authority, you know, I, I think that it would be very challenging. And so we would have to, um, we'd really have to, I would think we would need to set up a brand new body. Um, and, and I'm, I am not optimistic that forces of conservation would win out over forces of uh, resource use and exploitation um, because um, it, 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 would be a, it would be an interesting debate in the public. And I think that at least in our current political climate that a lot of the international bodies are so bogged down in not being able to see the big picture on things such as climate change, for example. And there's so much um, uh, national interest that's overwhelming the global interest that I'm not, I'm not optimistic for um, things being any different for the discovery of life outside of our world. Okay, so you would say then that should humans go to an extraterrestrial environment that ultimately that environment would, would, uh, would deteriorate? Yes, I do. And, you know, at, at the risk of sounding like every other science fiction writer, I, I do believe that, that that would potentially happen. But I have to say that I don't imagine that happening quickly or, uh, you know, in, in any sort of short time frame. And so given that my cynicism is partly a, a product of the current political climate and then marrying that with the idea that we are not going to be, in, you know, colonizing or harvesting natural resources from another planet for a very long time, maybe I'm optimistic that things get better here on Earth and we come to develop better international instruments for dealing with these sorts of things. Um, maybe we have a climate crisis here on Earth that uh, brings us to some sort of point of clarity that then international bodies are able to work more effectively 200 years in the future. I suppose I could be optimistic about that. Okay. So one final question, looking back at the topic. So would you say that there is in fact, that there is in fact an obligation to protect and preserve extraterrestrial life, microbial life from a scientific standpoint specifically? Yes, yes, I would most certainly say that I believe that there is an ethical, um, an overriding ethical obligation. Um, and you know, the word protect, if we're talking about individuals, individuals, organisms, like an individual microbe. I don't know if we have an obligation to protect an individual microbe, but to preserve um, at the species and population level, absolutely we do. Great. That's about all the time we have for today. Dr. Glaser, I would like to sincerely thank you on behalf of everyone at the Ast Astrobiology Debates for giving up your time to provide such useful and informative insight on your perspective on this issue. Thank you. Thank you, Jeffrey. It was very interesting. Thanks again. Mm -hmm. Goodbye.